Hey Club 56ers, it's so nice to see you guys again. Today I have a special guest with me to teach you guys a lesson. It's my sister Allie. Let's bring her out and I'll see you guys later. Oh, hey Club 56, I didn't see you guys there. I didn't know Maddie meant right now. What time is it? Okay, that's fine with me. Well, I'm so excited to be here today with you. If you're watching this on Sunday, that means we are one week away from Easter. It is so awesome that we get to take time out of our day to dive deeper into the Bible and our relationship with God. I'm going to talk about Luke chapter 1 through 19. The parts that we're going to be focusing on are about Jesus' birth, childhood, and ministry before his death. Let's take a look at a video to get a better picture of what was happening in the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke Luke investigated many of the earliest eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus and then composed this account. And the story begins up in the hills of Jerusalem, the place where Israel's ancient prophets said that God himself would come one day to establish his kingdom over all the earth. In the city is the temple run by the priests. And one of them, named Zechariah, was working in the temple when he had a vision that freaks him out. An angel appears and says that he and his wife will have a son. What's this all about? Well, Zechariah and his wife, we're told, are very old. They've never been able to have children. And Luke's setting up a parallel here with Abraham and Sarah, the great ancestors of Israel, because they too were very old and could never have kids. Yet God gave them a son, Isaac, which is how the whole story of Israel began. And so Luke's implying here that God's about to do something that significant for this people once again. The angel tells Zechariah to name the son John. And then he says that this son's going to fulfill a promise of Israel's ancient prophets, that somebody would come one day to prepare Israel to meet their God when he arrived to rule in Jerusalem. Because right now, Jerusalem is ruled by the Romans. Yeah, specifically, it's governed by a man named Herod, who's a puppet king under the Roman Empire. And so the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to be free and govern themselves in their own land. So this is shocking news. Everything's going to change. God's on his way. But how is he going to arrive? Well, to find out, Luke takes us out of Jerusalem and then up into a small town in the hills of an out-of-the-way region called Galilee. And there we find a young woman named Mariam, or we call her Mary. She was engaged to be married. And then an angel appears to Mary saying that she's going to have a son. She's supposed to name him Jesus, which in Hebrew means the Lord saves. And he will be a king like David who will rule over God's people forever. And then Mary asks, OK, well, how is this possible? Because I'm a virgin. And she's told that the same Holy Spirit that brought life and light out of darkness in Genesis chapter 1 is going to generate life inside her womb. God is about to bind himself to humanity through the conception and the birth of the Messiah. And so Mary goes from some backwoods no-name girl to the future mother of the king? Exactly. In fact, she sings a song about how this reversal of her own social status points to a greater upheaval to come. Through her son, God's going to bring down rulers from their thrones and exalt the poor and the humble. He's going to turn the whole world order upside down. So when Mary was really pregnant, she and her fiancé Joseph had to go down to Bethlehem. Yeah, there was a decree across the Roman Empire about new taxes, and so everybody had to go get registered in the town of their family line. There were so many visitors in Bethlehem, they can't find a guest room. And so the only place they can find is a spot where animals sleep. Now nearby were some shepherds with their flocks, and an angel appears, which of course <gasps> freaks them out. But they're told to celebrate because tonight in Bethlehem, a savior has been born. Yeah, they're told to go and find this baby, and they'll know that it's the Messiah because he's going to be wrapped up and laying in a grimy feeding trough. Yeah, which is pretty gross. Totally. And then these shepherds, who aren't very clean themselves, they go and find the newborn Jesus in this really dingy place, and their minds are blown. They go home wondering what on earth is about to happen. And this is all really strange. I mean, if God's really coming to save the world, this isn't how you would expect him to arrive. Born in an animal shelter to a teenage girl, celebrated by no-name shepherds. Exactly. I mean, everything is backwards in Luke's story, and that's the point. He is showing how God's kingdom was first revealed in these dirty places among the poor, because Jesus is here to bring salvation by turning our world order upside down.
The Gospel according to Luke began by telling us about the births of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And in the next section of the Gospel, Luke zooms forward in time. So John is now a prophet and he's leading a renewal movement down at the Jordan River and all of these Israelites are coming to be baptized, the poor, the rich, tax collectors, even soldiers. Yeah, what's going on here? So all of these people are dedicating themselves to a new way of life. By getting dunked in a river? So long ago, Israel came to inherit this land by crossing through the Jordan River and God gave them a responsibility. They were called to serve him alone, to love their neighbor and pursue justice together. And we know from stories in the Old Testament that they've failed at this repeatedly. Right. So John's calling Israel to start over, to go back through the river and come out rededicated to their God, ready for the new thing that God's about to do. And so it's within this renewal movement that Jesus first appeared. Jesus is baptized by John and the sky opens up and a voice from heaven says, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, God's words here are packed with echoes from the Hebrew scriptures. This first line is from Psalm 2, where God promised that a king would come who would rule in Jerusalem and confront evil among the nations. And then this next line is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and it refers to the Messiah who would become a servant and suffer and die on Israel's behalf. After this, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days with no food. I mean, that's roughing it. And in this story, Jesus is replaying Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness where they failed to trust their God and so they rebelled. But Jesus succeeded by resisting temptation and trusting God. And so this story is marking Jesus as the one who's going to carry Israel's story forward. After the wilderness, Jesus comes back to the region of Galilee, to his hometown, Nazareth. He's in the synagogue and he's invited to read from the scriptures. And he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Why to the poor? Well, in Hebrew culture, being poor wasn't just about money. It was more about low social status. So women and children and the sick, people on the margin. And surprisingly, this could include people who had money, like tax collectors. They were considered outsiders too, and so Jesus is here for them. Then Jesus continues reading. The Lord has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Freedom seems like a big deal for Jesus. Yes, Jesus was freeing people from their sicknesses, from their past, from their shame, and he was freeing them to become a part of God's new kingdom that Jesus said he was bringing into reality. After this, Jesus appoints 12 men from among all of his disciples as leaders to help him in his mission. And that number, 12, it's a very intentional symbol of the 12 tribes of Israel. But this is a ragtag bunch of guys. You've got a fisherman, you've got a former tax collector who worked for the Roman occupation, you have a former rebel who fought against the Roman occupation. There's no way these guys are going to get along. Yeah, Jesus intentionally brought together people who were outsiders and sworn enemies, but inside God's kingdom, They're called to reconcile and to live in unity. Following Jesus meant entering a new world order. And so Jesus went on to teach, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you because of me. Jesus even told his disciples to love their enemies, be strangely generous, even to people they don't like, to forgive and show mercy. This is a radical way of life. And Jesus not only taught about all of this, he promised that he would lead the way, that he would be radically generous and forgive and love his enemies by making the ultimate sacrifice, by giving up his life. The last story in this section of Luke is fascinating. Jesus takes some of his disciples up onto a mountain and God's glory appears as a bright cloud and Jesus is suddenly transformed. And there's two other prophets that appear, Moses and Elijah. Yeah, they're the ancient prophets who also experience God's glory on a mountain. And then God speaks from the cloud saying, this is my son, listen to him. Luke is showing us that Jesus is the ultimate prophet. He is God's word to Israel. The three of them talk about what Jesus is gonna do when he arrives in Jerusalem. What's he going to do? He's going to go to the capital city to be enthroned as Israel's true king, but not in the way that anybody expected. And with that, Jesus' mission up in Galilee comes to an end. And the next part of Luke's gospel begins. 
with his long journey to Jerusalem. The Gospel of Luke opened with the birth of Jesus. Then Luke showed us how Jesus was Israel's Messiah announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor and how he was God's true prophet to Israel. In this next section, Jesus sets out with his disciples on a long road trip to Jerusalem where they'll join thousands of Israelites to celebrate the ancient feast of Passover. Now, Luke wants this road trip from the mountain to Jerusalem to remind you of ancient Israel's long road trip. With Moses, they went from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land. And then later, King David established Jerusalem as their capital. And so here, Luke is portraying Jesus as a new Moses, who's renewing Israel's covenant with God, and as a new David. He's gathering the people together to live under his rule. As Jesus leaves, he sends out a wave of his followers ahead of him to prepare each new place for his visit. Then Jesus would arrive, announcing the good news of God's kingdom, and he would call people to follow him and join this new thing God was doing in Israel. There are many of his teachings and parables in this section, specifically about how following Jesus will force you to totally rethink your money, how you resolve conflict, and how you treat the poor. In every town, Jesus would create communities of people who were learning to live in a totally new way, so that greed would be transformed into generosity and anger into forgiveness. And in these Jesus communities, all outsiders are welcome. Yeah, good news for the poor. That's one of Luke's main themes. Yeah, you'll find it all over this section. The marginalized people that he heals, the shamed sex workers he reaches out to, the tax collectors he includes. This is Jesus's kingdom crew. And Israel's religious leaders watch and start to criticize him. If he really is God's prophet, why is he welcoming sinners and eating with them? Yeah, this section reads like the battle of the banquets. So Jesus throws these dinner parties as a symbol of how God's kingdom is here for the sick and the poor, people who could never pay him back. Jesus also attends banquets with Israel's religious leaders. Yeah, and he lays into them for becoming an arrogant, exclusive social club. But they don't get it. And so he tells them a famous parable that goes like this. There was a father who had two sons. The older son is trustworthy and honors his father. And the younger son, he's a mess. He rebels and cashes in his inheritance to travel far away and blow it all on partying and being stupid. And then there's a famine in the land and he runs out of money. So he has to scrape by by taking care of somebody's pigs. And he's so hungry, he wants to eat the pig slop, at which point it occurs to him, if I'm going to be a farmhand, I might as well go home and work for my dad. At least I won't be eating pig food. So he treks back home, rehearsing his apology. Now, the father is certain that his son did not survive the famine. But then, one day, he sees someone walking down the road. It's his son. He's not dead. And so the father runs to him and embraces his son, kissing him all over. The son starts his speech. Dad, I don't deserve to be your son. Maybe I could come and work for you. But before he can finish, the father calls his servants to go get the nicest robe, new sandals, a fancy ring for his son. They are to prepare the best food for a banquet. It is time to celebrate. Now, later that day, the older brother arrives from a long day working in the field to discover his long lost loser of a brother has come home and they're celebrating. And he gets angry. And think about it. He's been faithful to his father all of these years. He never got a party like this. And and then this disgrace of a family member comes home and they're going to celebrate him? It's disgusting. He refuses to join the banquet. So the father finds the older brother outside and he says, Son, you are already in our family. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate your brother because he was lost. And now he's found. He was dead. But now he's alive. Jesus wants the religious leaders to see the outsiders the way God sees them, as sons and daughters that are being reclaimed from death. Jesus' kingdom community was wide open to anybody. The only entry requirement is to humble yourself and recognize your need for God's mercy. And so the religious leader's rejection of Jesus and his crew is actually a rejection of the God of Israel. The leaders don't like all of this. And so as Jesus' road trip comes to an end, the conflict is at a boiling point. Yeah, he's going to ride towards Jerusalem for Passover as they plot to take his life. And that's what the next section of Luke is all about. Videos like this help bring to life stories from the Bible. At the very beginning of Luke, it shows us God fulfilling his promises from the Old Testament that Jesus would be the one to fulfill it. While Jesus was on earth, he brought together people who didn't belong because in the kingdom of God, we are called to reconcile and live in unity. Jesus taught us how to love our enemies, be crazy generous, forgive, show mercy, and more. In heaven, there's room for everyone. 
Right now, open up your Bible to Luke 12, 34. If you don't have your Bible in front of you, pause this video and go grab it. Luke 12, 34 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I just read the NIV version, but another version I like is from the Message Bible, and it says, the place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Jesus was talking to his disciples about money and possessions. He wasn't teaching about how important it is to save money or keep everything for yourself. He was trying to show them to put their faith in God because he will supply all of their needs. When we get focused on things of this world, we lose focus on what really matters, our relationship with God. Luke 12, 34 shows us that what we value the most, that's where our heart is. That's where our actions, decisions, and thoughts come from. If our heart is not on the right thing, we can make bad, hurtful, and even mean decisions that impact the people around us. When you spend time with God by reading your Bible, you draw closer to Him. When you draw closer to Him, that's where your heart will be too. When our heart is for the things of God, our life becomes happier, brighter, and we become the best version of ourselves we can be. Now let's take a look at Luke 16, 10 through 13 this time. I'm gonna be reading from the message version. If you're honest in the small things, you'll be honest in the big things. If you're a crook in the small things, you'll be a crook in the big things. If you're not being honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No workers can serve two bosses. We either hate the first one and love the second one, or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and money. During this time, Jesus was teaching about different parables. If you do not know what a parable is, it simply means it's a story to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. In this parable, Jesus is showing us that we cannot serve God and the world. And just how Luke 12, 34 said, where our treasure is, our heart will be also, this is Jesus showing us how following him will change our perspective. When you are baptized, it represents the old you going away and a new you coming out of the water. When we follow Christ, we become Christ-like. Our attitude changes, the way we speak to others changes, the way we handle bad news changes, but all of these things do not happen instantly. God sent Jesus to be the example for us. Anything we have ever gone through, he has too. This is how Jesus is God's word. He's our savior. Jesus teaches us how we can actively work on the fruits of the spirit. Pray knowing God hears us, read our Bibles and be encouraged that everything that happens around us works for our benefit even when we don't see it. This is why it is important for you to spend some time reading your Bible, whether it's for 10 minutes or an hour, any time with God can change our lives. This is why we celebrate Easter, because of a wild, crazy, generous, radically different guy named Jesus. Next week, you guys are going to dive deeper into Jesus' death, resurrection, and what we do now as followers of Christ. To continue to help you dive deeper into your faith in Jesus, on our Club 56 website, you can find a week-long devotional that goes along with what you just learned today. There are also discussion questions there too for you to use for self-reflection or for a bigger family discussion time. Before we get into announcements, let me bring my sister, Maddie, back here. Whoa, hey guys. I don't know about y'all, but I love getting to see the life of Jesus today. Me too, but now it's time for the announcement. Each Wednesday, I will announce a new Club 56 challenge, and our current challenge is to send in your craziest, wildest quarantine snack you've eaten. It can be whipped cream on a hot dog, oranges with ranch, grilled cheese with ketchup, <laughs> maybe even eggs with mayo and mustard. Your parents can tag at City Point Church on Insta or Facebook with the hashtag Club56Challenge. Take a picture or for more chances to win, send a video of you eating the food too. The last day to submit an entry is Tuesday, April 7th, and the winner will be announced on Wednesday, April 8th. Oh, and the winner gets an awesome prize delivered to them too. Each week, you can check out citypointchurch.com slash club56 to find your weekly scripture and current hashtag club56 challenge, weekly devotional, new lessons and games, and experiments for you and your family to try out that week. That's all we have for you today. I can't wait to see all the crazy, weird foods you've eaten during quarantine.